this is a fun week for me. I it's it's the seventh anniversary of working for nine to five max. So like this feels like a significant uh point in time for myself. And if it's the seventh anniversary for you, it must be the seventh anniversary for me as well. Yeah, that's why I brought it up because there there was not a period where we didn't work together really. <laughs> it was very close. Yeah, um, like you started like at the start of April pretty much, right? April first, yeah. Yeah, and I kind of like I think my first post was on the twenty third of April. Mm-hmm. So but for like the first like three months, I think I only posted like four times because I was, you know, juggling uni and I was like not very confident with, you know, Nightfire Mac and stuff, and then I kind of got into the groove or whatever. But yeah, it is we've been on a journey for a while. And th- and that makes the podcast like is is it five years old now? We're on the seven five or six, yeah. Yeah, we're on the two hundred and seventy first episode. We don't skip weeks, even for holidays. So I think it's like five years. That's that's really cool. I I don't think about things that way, but like you know, my kid is my kids are seven and two, <laughs> so like, and this all predates them really. So yeah, but, like we started doing the show the the year I joined university, basically. Mm-hmm. And so you and went through the whole like, process, and yeah, so that so that was like three years and an anniversary now, basically four years out of university. It's kind of crazy how the time goes. Yeah, I look at a number like two hundred seventy one episodes, and it just doesn't feel that significant you know it's 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 because it's not like 500 or anything yet um but that's uh, it, five years though is, is what yeah 271 is what, divided by 52 is 5.2 years yeah so, so like five years man huh maybe like we did like a couple of emergency episodes like maybe like one time or two times so <laughs> but but not many um man I, yeah i just wanted to, to think about that for a second you know and we, we did that, we did that episode wasn't it like um Maybe a couple of years ago or last year, where we just like looked back at the podcast and uh, it must have been like last last fall, last winter, because we were talking about like milestones in Apple's history. And uh, yeah, I think maybe uh, I can't remember if it was, exact, but we did a, we, when we did the year in review, we talked about our first Apple products, right? And okay, yeah, how we got joined into the Apple world, and we definitely talked about like the podcast stuff a bit then. For sure. Yeah, I think it became like half the episode. So yeah, yeah. nice. So I'll, I will try and search for that and and uh, put that in the in the show notes on this episode. Um, first, uh, in terms of stories, I want to talk about some some new exclusives that we have at Nine to Five Mac this week, um, and then some quick headlines, and then we'll get into some greater topics after that. So the first thing uh, that that's new that we cover this week is um, it comes from comes from Felipe Esposito for Nine to Five Mac. And it is the headline is that Keychain uh, Password Manager in iOS 14 will gain new one password like features. And the key here is that um, this is all based on the iOS 14 code that we've been looking at for a while now. That iCloud Keychain for the first time will be able to manage two factor authentication, authentication, uh, and and that's different than now because you need to have a third party app to do that, and it's. Uh, like there's Apple stuff that, that you use your device for as like the second, uh, you know, sort of a- way to authorize, but otherwise... Yes, you- Apple obviously integrates two-factor into the OS for its services. Yeah, but, but if, if you, you want to like- do Twitter or something, it's like you do SMS or an app from the App Store. Yeah, so you have to go to the App Store and you have to get like Google Authenticator or you have to get like the Authy one. And I use one password for it now. You use one password, yeah. yeah. You- I... I- I don't use one password, so I rely on iCloud Keychain for you know actual like website password syncing, uh-huh. which is and, reasonable. I mean, it's built in. Yeah, and it works. For, I've never had a problem with it, but yeah, it really annoys me that I can't put my two factor codes in there as well. And I used one app for a while, and then I deleted it, and then I lost them all. So that was a pain. Oh no! And then, <laughs> and then I at the moment I have it worthy, but because it's uh, like because it's not like built in or from. It just feels flimsy, and like one day it might go away, or it might stop working. Or does it, it populate your your clipboard, and or like if it comes if it comes time to paste it in, does it show up on the um, the keyboard suggestions like like an SMS code would? It does not show up on the keyboard. Okay, because one password be- does, and that just feels like what we'll see from from Apple's when it happens too. Is like that's what yeah it will show for up. sure. Like uh, yeah, Apple uh, Apple put it on the keyboard. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I think one password's kind of like half hacking that that API that shows it there because it's only meant to be four passwords not two factor codes so they're probably kind of like you know we're just treating it like a password even though it's not if you see what I mean so right yeah I think it's great I'm really happy if they add like they just let me put it in in that database because I, I, there are definitely services that I will not name but I do have services that I still rely on a SMS for primarily because mm. like 
I don't have a good place to put the two factor codes, right? Like, mm-hmm. I'm I'm always scared of like Authy just not launching on a beta, you know, like the iOS 14 beta. Authy doesn't launch, and I'm screwed. If you know what I mean. Whereas if it was built in, I'm a lot more comfortable with that. So yeah, Ap- I, I would happily, I'm ready to put my two factor codes into iCloud Keychain. Give it to me. Yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, that will be a cool feature. Uh, Apple's made SMS so easy too that it's like, we, we know it's not secure and it's it's sometimes maybe better to not even have that on SMS than to, than to use it at all um, because your phone number you know is 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 not protected and, and can be spoofed um but uh they've made it so easy that if you if you would like the autofill stuff on the keyboard that like if you get an sms code to your phone and have yep. S- sms messages appear on your mac um you know it'll pop up there and like you can populate it or or, or even on your phone or your ipad so uh it's very easy to, to use that method and it and so in that case if you don't use another app like one password um or your app makes you go and copy and paste and it's like way harder to not use sms so that this will even the playing field there um, so bring it on yeah uh, one thing um i was kind of upset that we didn't find evidence of is like a dedicated passwords app because, yeah man like the iCloud like keychain is a functional service but the ui when you're not getting the keyboard autofill is like a third level down into settings and it's very unpretty and like you know i can get on with it but it's my fam i also just tell my family to use iCloud keychain because they're not gonna use you know what what is one password to them like exactly they're not going to do it but they're like you know if on the occasion where they have to go in and find the password it's like i have to tell them where to go every single time because it's not you it's not very user friendly at all it's like a debug console more I, I i tell my aunt to use one password because of that same reason but it's the opposite solution that i don't think she could ever figure out you know the, the ui for for i call keychain but then she can do one password so it's, yeah so they yeah. they need a Apple needs to make like a passwords app that's dedicated on the home screen and it's actually meant to be user facing and just list it can list basically work off the same data source as iCloud Keychain but actually have like a better visual for it. Mm-hmm. Yep. The next story is about the Apple Watch and this this new um, Apple Watch for kids sort of mode that the watch can be in. And we, we learned that from iOS 14 and watchOS 7 uh, code. The, the, the other thing we learned from that is that there'll be this new school time mode where the watch can behave in certain ways um, during certain hours, like school time. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing here is that it, it, it's an answer to how will the watch address activity tracking for kids because I know as a dad and with, with my daughter wearing an Apple Watch, um, <laughs> she can do something like very... She can run around playing at her heart way up, you know, or she can run around playing do a lot of movement, but she's not getting very much credit on the watch because she's a kid and it's like not hard. And um, I, I don't think her heart rate is that high. Um, so it's just not a very good, like, like using that and then how to burn calories and everything is just not a very good goal. Um, so I don't even have her pay attention to any of that at all. Um, but what, what what will be new here is they, they kind of have a playful name for it internally, which is like um, the Apple Watch Junior Experience. And what that will do is replace the the move ring, which is the red ring in in the activity rings. Um, that uses active calories right now. And when you're using the Apple Watch in kids mode, it'll it'll use move time instead. So I think the Apple Watch already tracks like move like how many minutes you're moving. And you'll see that in trends, and you'll see that in different places. But you you can't make that a ring. Um, at least in this kids mode for the Apple Watch, move time will be. Like, you know, the customizable goal there. So 30 minutes of exercise won't change. 12 stand hours won't change. Um, but then the move time is what you can set. So then you could say, rather than having a 500 calorie, uh, active calories burned goal, you could have 90 minutes of just movement throughout the day or whatever the, the goal recommendation is. And, um, you know, then it tracks not just like when you're, you know, super active and everything, but like, you know, if you're, if you're a kid playing outside, like, you know, that kind of thing will, that will be easier to fill in. So, uh, I like this a lot. It was it's something that I, I, I recognize as an, as an issue for my, my daughter using the Apple Watch, but just didn't think much of it because it's kind of like outside of the intended use. Um, but then this this is the answer to like, you know, that, that problem. So it's nice. Yeah, that is actually... I'm surprised they're not going to like modify the stand ring. I don't know. I feel that's quite like anti-child as well, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Mm. It's not very clear. Like the exercise minute one makes sense. The move time... It's fine, even though that's then kind of similar to the green ring, if you know what I mean, because that's also measured in time. And then, I, I think, I think, well, I think, move time is in development. So maybe they're going to change the other rings as well. That's but true, but it's I, good I, that they're like adapting it at all, right? Yeah, I think, I think, move time though is much easier to register than exercise. Like I can go for a bike ride and track the workout, 
and have like five minutes of exercise from a an hour long bike ride. <laughs> and part of it is like I'm just not exhausting myself. Um, so I think I think move time is much easier to to to, to register than exercise because um, it's, it's that brisk walk or above that is exercise, and then like like if you're actually trying to simplify it for a child, then maybe you should only have move time and not have the other two. I think the I think stand is stand is, is often confused, um, but it's either it, it it stand it stand up and move around for a minute of every hour. Yeah. And um, that one I'm okay with because, like, if you're sitting at your desk doing homework or if you're sitting on the couch playing video games, like, it's not a bad idea to, to get up and walk around, take a break, you know, drink a glass of water, and, and then, you know, kind of start start from scratch. Um, but, yeah, and then the exercise one, as long as it's easier because it, it's so hard sometimes to, to register. Like, if you're just doing, like, a, um, you know, a, a casual walk that isn't a brisk walk. Um, or in my case, like the bike ride the other night, <laughs> I was tired. <laughs> I was ready to stop riding, but then I, I had only registered five minutes of exercise. So, you know. um, yeah, but, but we'll see how that ends up developing because, you know, this is all from December really. And then, and it's not until, uh, June that we see the first version of it come out and beta and then September. And obviously reported on all the trackpad and cursor stuff being in the 14 build and then they shipped it early in 13.4. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah. And then some some stuff won't be available, you know, even though it was in the code. So it'll, it'll come much later, if ever. Um, next thing is is uh, it, there was this version of uh, of Logic that includes this live loop feature that you see on GarageBand for iPad, and uh, it was shown in Logic for Mac on uh, a, a section of Apple's website, and it was since removed. But it's definitely an unreleased version of Logic, and it's like another classic case of Apple leaking their own stuff um, officially. <laughs> so when I looked at the Apple Store, there was this whole thing that was like, if it's not on Apple.com, uh, it's not official yet. <laughs> like, so you know, it's like <laughs> that was the answer to you know customers asking about like future iPhones. And um, there's so many cases now where <laughs> a leak happens on Apple.com, making it official. Um, this is one of those things. Uh, and I I don't mess I don't I don't play much with the GarageBand. Uh, on iPhone or iPad, like I used to do with GarageBand on the Mac, um, but I, I know if if I was that was like my first access to it, I totally would and I'd love it. The live loops thing is you've already got like a loops feature where you can bring in loops from this like catalog of of uh, Apple supplied loops. Um, the live loop one is like more dynamic, and so I think that'll be that'll be kind of cool. And it's just crazy. Yeah, that the it's live loop one's like a really like sophisticated beat pad where it cycles through the grid basically over and over and you can turn things off change things around move them up and down and they they added that with the original ipad pro like 2015 ipad pro so it's been in garage band for ios for a long time and it has not yet made the jump to to the desktop mm-hmm. yeah yeah and, and it's one of the appeals to me from live loops is, is with the loops there's a much greater chance that you're going to use the same loop as some, something else that'll be familiar mm-hmm. and it's just like it's just more stock, and with a live loop, there's so much uh, potential for like making it a, a dynamic that you made different choices than somebody else did for that same loop that it'll sound different. Um, so I, I like it. I, I hope to see it soon. Um, and yeah. I, this could be just complete like you know wish casting, but maybe the screenshot that we saw was representing a new logic for Mac that. We'll also have an iPad counterpart. It's very good screen uh, wish casting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, last week I mentioned that I was trying this adapter for CarPlay that turned standard CarPlay in cars that you buy that come with CarPlay into wireless CarPlay because, like, my 2017 Honda Civic has an integrated screen that also controls, you know, um, everything else in the car. Basically, you know, definitely the, the uh, climate. In the, in the car. And so uh, I didn't want to change the screen. It would look very weird to have a, a different screen in the car and, and I'd lose like some, some control. So uh, I tried this adapter with very limited, uh, low expectations and it turns out that it actually worked. Um, I mentioned uh, that last week I'd put it in the show notes and I forgot and someone emailed to ask for it and I, I replied back with the email, uh, my mistake. This week I'll have a link of the actual review of like what it looks like and how it works. So um, it surprised me. This is something that... Um, I didn't know like how much interest there was in this, but uh, you know I cover CarPlay, and this was like a big impact for me in terms of using CarPlay because suddenly my car has wireless CarPlay, and it it really 
is is great. Like a wired car play is fine for like longer trips, you know, where you know you're going to be plugged in. Um, but getting the the music from your phone, your contacts, uh, you know, navigation, or, or even for like traffic around town, it's really cool to have without having to plug in your phone. And so this says that. And and the the, the first night, like I tried putting it together, and, and it um it, it worked all right, and I didn't need to drive. And the next time I, I got in the car, like it really surprised me. It's like I didn't even think about it. Like was I wasn't expecting it. And then this CarPlay was there. Um, and I, I even did a thing in the review of like a video of how long it took to to initiate um, from cranking the car up to having CarPlay be ready to go. And it's like you know, it's it's a thirty eight second video, and some of that is is just like just seeing CarPlay already be active. So it was like an it was like thirty two seconds, thirty two seconds tops, which is not that bad compared to like you know getting in the car, going off and like thinking, oh, now I need to plug in the phone. You know, it's just, it's, it's not terrible at all. Um, something you mentioned to me was like, there's, ob- there's obviously the risk of uh, a future update to iOS, like breaking this. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily the, the, the adapter gets firmware updates. So th- there's incentive for, for them to keep supporting this in future versions of iOS if possible. Yeah. That's um, definitely a nice safety net. So that, that, that they're, cause obviously they're selling the same hardware over and over and over again on Amazon and they're just updating the software every time that iOS changes. Yeah. And so if there is a way for them to do it when the next iOS update comes out, they can do it. But there's always obviously the lingering risk that, you know, Apple closes whatever loophole they're using for good and then they can't do it anymore. Yeah. There's a really weird thing on on, on the uh the, the UI of this thing, which which is like uh when you, I guess it's when you're pairing and when you, if, I, I, I tried to do a thing where um, I, I went for a drive without my phone and you still saw CarPlay as like an option on the, the Cars UI and uh, I tapped it and then it like launched the like looking for device or, or like pick your devices if you've got multiple um, screen. And and so I thought maybe, just maybe I could pair my watch to this thing <laughs> and it would actually work for the first time where I can stream from my Apple Watch to the car stereo I've, I've tried. To, I've tried other adapters, you know, and they don't. They haven't worked for me yet. So maybe this would be the, this would be it. And it wouldn't connect. It wouldn't, the watch couldn't find it. Um, but the UI is hilarious because it just looks like an iPhone. Like it, it's it's iOS. Um, it show it shows like your signal, and it shows like you if you had two SIMs with with perfect signal. <laughs> so there's like the the bars, and there's like the dots under the bars. Uh, That's wild. And some some yeah. So it's it's. Do it's, you remember? About six months ago now, when Quo released the report about there being a portless iPhone in 2021. Yeah. And one of the uh, mitigations that we came up with was, what if Apple sells a dongle, a wireless dongle oh, yeah. that has the port back? And this is basically that, because it's streaming CarPlay wirelessly from the port to the car. Yeah, I mean... It's, the, the, I think the adapter requires the car to have CarPlay to work, so the, the car firmware needs to be there. Yeah, for sure, because obviously the, the 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 adapter's pretending like it's plugged in directly, so yeah. it's sending the CarPlay signal, which the car can read. Uh-huh. If if the CarPlay signal was sent to a car that doesn't understand CarPlay, it just wouldn't know what to do with it. it right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so app, and, and for that reason, like you, you just wouldn't ever expect to see even Apple make an adapter that gives you CarPlay in any car with a screen. Um, but yeah, I mean, man, <laughs> if if they want to bring wireless CarPlay to all these cars that already have regular CarPlay, a version of this from Apple that will always always be maintained would be worth it. Shoot, man, and Apple loves <laughs> selling a good dongle. <laughs> yeah, they do, and and you know, a hundred bucks versus like. The price of a new head unit and the installation and you know the labor involved in that is 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 a deal. You know, it's great. And in my car, I was just never going to change. I was never going to risk messing up my existing setup for this. You know, for wireless. But uh, steering wheel controls work, <laughs> playback works. Like all, it's it's great. So, um, so this week you can, you can actually go and like read the review of that and see all the pictures and everything and and a little video too. Uh, next up, I want to talk about some app updates, starting with Spotify, which has a new version of their app on the Apple Watch. For WatchOS 6, you can now use Siri to control your Spotify library. A lot of people wanted this. A lot more people are upset that they did this and not offline music for Spotify on the Apple Watch. Um, I don't know. That, I don't use Spotify, so I, I use Apple Music and I have everything you, you could want. But if you use Spotify for some reason, then you know a, a you know personal reason, then this is this is a 
halfway there, you're, you're, you're one closer to having a decent experience on the Apple watch. You just can't sync your music over to it and, uh, play it offline or stream it. Right. Yes. No. Well, it's, like, it's basically your remote control, and now you can use voice control yeah, for yeah. that. Yeah, I meant no, as in yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then last, Spotify has the capability, but they <laughs> don't want to do it. They cry about. They cried about wanting people to be able to do it, and now they can do it. They haven't done it. Yeah. Yeah. Their their EU, you know, uh, propaganda campaign of like it's not fair. It's just not aging well. Um, hmm. Last app I want to mention is Facebook Messenger for Mac. This was uh, announced over a year ago and then released in some countries a month ago as of uh, Thursday of this week. It's available, appears to be globally, at least it's in the U.S. and a bunch of other places now. So uh, if, if Messenger on the Mac is your thing, then, then there you go. Um, w- one thing about it and a bunch of other messaging apps that I, I, have, I have to use is um, you know, messages, like you close the app, it's closed, and you still get messages from it, you know, and you can choose to open <laughs> yeah. or not. Like, no one else can do that, right? So that's the same case here. And uh, there seems to be a bug in it, like, where if you leave it open, but not, like, having a window shown, it will open when you open another window <laughs> for some reason, which is concerning. Um, and then the behind-the-scenes part of this is that it, it's 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 an Electron app, not a, a Mars or well, Catalyst app. So it's not the iPad version; it's its whole whole version on its own. So, I just to correct you slightly, I'm pretty sure a third-party app could still send you notifications when the app's closed. Mm, so an app like I use Delivery to track packages, and there there's an optional, maybe even like a separate installation. Where you, where you say, like, keep running Deliveries Express in the background. Yeah, so it's like you, you have to consent to it. So maybe that's what they... And, and then at that right, point... I think with the Deliveries thing, that's all because it's happening on your Mac, right? Yeah. It, doesn't have a, it doesn't have the server sending the notifications. Mm. But an app like Facebook Messenger could register for push notifications on the Mac and then do the same thing that it would do on iOS because obviously the iOS app isn't running all the time. It just receives notifications and shows them. Mm-hmm. It could do the same thing on the Mac because then the Facebook servers are sending the notifications to your machine. Uh, so if they wanted to, they could do that. Oh, there was a mail app that did this. It was Spark uh, a while ago, yes. several years ago, and it really annoyed Yeah, me. that's because that's, that's a big... That's why all the third-party mail apps on iOS... Uh, basically run your run the inbox on the server so they can send the push notifications to uh-huh. your device yeah when the app shut yeah and it was controversial whenever spark was doing it and for me it just didn't work because i was uh, now i use apple mail for both work and personal but i was using uh, another other apps for, for work so i could turn it off if it want, and still use my mac and um and i couldn't turn it off when i was using spark i was still, I was still getting notified so well cool i, I learned something that i i semi knew already Finding the right person to hire for your company can be challenging. So when you're ready to hire, LinkedIn can help. LinkedIn Jobs matches your role with qualified candidates so you can find the right person quickly. Get up and running from the LinkedIn Jobs dashboard. Simply start with your company name, job title, and location. LinkedIn is an active community of professionals with 675 million members worldwide. And the LinkedIn Jobs platform screens candidates with the hard and soft skills that you're looking for so you can hire the right person fast. Education and grades are important, but LinkedIn also considers qualities like collaboration, work ethic, and adaptability. LinkedIn Jobs finds people that are not only qualified, but fit in with your company's culture. LinkedIn does the legwork to find the most qualified candidates so you can focus on hiring the person who will transform your business. It looks beyond work skills and connects you with candidates who match your business perfectly. LinkedIn Jobs makes sure your job post gets in front of the people that you want to hire. And that's why companies rate LinkedIn Jobs the number one hiring platform for delivering quality hires. Find the right person for your business today with LinkedIn Jobs. You can pay what you want and get the first $50 off. Just visit linkedin.com slash happy hour. Again, that's linkedin.com slash happy hour to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks to LinkedIn Jobs for sponsoring the show. Apple has a new website and a new app for screening uh, yourself based on your experience to decide uh, if if you 
were exposed to coronavirus and, and might have uh, uh, COVID-19 and need to seek help. So um, it's it's a very simple app. It's a very simple website. And you just walk through and answer a few questions on a survey. Um, some of the questions seem a little bit outdated, but this, this is made in partnership with the Center for Disease Control with the White House and with FEMA. And um, it was out of the blue. Apple hadn't announced this, the website or the app before there was an announcement that Google would have something like this. And I don't yeah, think this was... <laughs> there was that whole drama about Google, about, you know, the president saying that Google was going to do it. And then Google said they weren't doing it. And then Google changed their mind because the president said they, they were making it. Mm-hmm. So then Google tried to make one over the weekend. And then, you know, like a week later, Apple's like, hey, we made one. <laughs> <laughs> I think Google's was in one state and it wasn't going well. And maybe it was more ambitious than this. I'm not sure. But um, it certainly wasn't out yet. And then Apple I, came I think out. what was promised was more ambitious. And then what they delivered was basically the same as what Apple did. Ah, if you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. Shocker. Yeah. Um, I tr- I tried the app and I answered. Um, uh, I, I don't think I answered like honestly, just to see like what will it do if if it wants you to to to, to uh, find you know follow up with this. But um, you know, it, it gives you. I, a- I mean, realistically, like the the uh, you know the government advice around the world and this survey uh it's simple enough, right, that you can know what it's going to tell you to do by the question, the way you answer each question, right? Like, yeah. If you have these symptoms, you're going to get told to go to the hospital. If you have these other symptoms or you don't have the core symptoms, you're going to get told to stay at home and self-isolate. That's I mean, it's, it's, the, it's like a flow chart. And yeah, <laughs> exactly. You... And there's like two exits. That's yeah, basically it. Correct. Are you dying right now? Like, if you've got a serious problem, you know, you need to call 911 immediately or the local the local emergency number. Mm-hmm. If you've got these symptoms, then you should probably go and get checked out if you're having struggling to breathe. Anything else, just stay at home and self-isolate, right? Cause yeah, that's... and I think it included, uh, I think it probably includes demographics because I'd probably answer my age. And, and But the, at the end of the thing, like I was trying to get it to tell me to go to the doctor and it told me to stay home for a couple of weeks. Um, one of the questions was, I think it was like very useful anymore. This is what I mean by outdated. It would ask if you had traveled uh, internationally recently. And in America, it doesn't matter. Like you it, you don't need to travel to a different city, you know, to, to risk exposure. So that question. Yeah, I mean, it's the same in Britain, right? Re- regardless of whether you're infected or not, you should stay at home and self-isolate. So right. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, um, obviously, they have to do this, right? And it's useful for some people who, you know, haven't seen any of the news coverage or they don't know and they just, oh, this is on the App Store. Maybe I should check it out. And, you know, it's probably helped a few, a, a small number of people get to the hospital when they otherwise wouldn't, if you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. But it's just nice common sense advice. And there was some backlash that was like, why is Apple doing this? It's like, oh, no, why is it Apple's job? It's like, they're a huge company, right? They have plenty of money. They're, if they want to help out by doing this, then let them do it, right? There's no harm, right? I mean, if, if, you're shopping not, for, it, if you're shopping for AirPods, there's a banner at the top of the page that will, will push you to the website if you click it. Yeah, it, it's basically just a form of awareness, right? And mm-hmm. in the yes. same way as that they're donating masks in the same way that they're doing... You know, they're putting the government videos on the front page of the App Store. Mm-hmm. This survey is basically just another form of awareness and marketing for, you know, the global health crisis. Like, it's perfectly within Apple's MO to, like, help the world, right? And it's... I, I, there's, I, don't, I can't... I don't, I, don't, I don't even understand how this was controversial at all because it's not <laughs> even, like... It's not doing any... It, if it was telling, like, random advice, like, you must wear your Apple Watch today or, you know, or you must do this thing that isn't... That isn't consistent any, you know, with no government health authorities recommending you do, right. then I can understand, like, you know, Apple shouldn't be giving medical advice, but it's not that. It's literally just like a essentially you're getting one of two outcomes at the end of this five question survey. Like, I don't understand why this was controversial. I, I think it's just nice. The big unspoken thing, too, is that uh, Apple's got the most trust in terms of privacy. So that you can, you know, if you're worried, you can you can do this without um, being worried if your data is going to be, you know, used for, for <laughs> anything else. So. Um, and there's certainly a lot of people who, or, or a number of people who um, take it less seriously than, than others. So, you know, so it's in, inconsistent that way. So uh, it's a positive thing. Yeah. I mean, just personally, you can probably tell from my voice this week. <laughs> I, you know, I, I may have COVID-19 right now. Like I do had, I had a bit of a cough. I didn't really have a fever. I had like flu symptoms, right? So the potential, it was probably just a cold, but it could have been coronavirus and you know, I'm just like, because because everyone in the country has to stay at home anyway. So it's not like, you know, it's not like, oh, I'm fine. I'll go out. Like everyone's just been sit- sitting at home or whatever. But uh, so I, I filled out the form and I actually did my real symptoms. And of course, it just tells you to stay at home and self-isolate. It's like, OK, great. You know, it's just it's basically just an ad for 
staying at home and self isolating, just wrapped up in a nice little survey. And I, I imagine you know, if just you spreading the world message. Imagine if you if you your if you used it instead, of like your age was older than than it would, or if you were in a certain risk group, because I think it asked you about um, different conditions, then, then it would give you different advice. But yeah, for, that makes sense for you. Um, let's talk about something that that. Uh, it's really interesting that, you, that I think you you were super excited about, which is Amazon Prime Video, and how you can now buy TV shows and movies in the app for the first time. Like this, this is this is massive. You could call this a significant shift. <laughs> you could. I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> right. So let's start with Netflix. Right, Netflix famously left the App Store because. They wanted to stop giving Apple 30% of their monthly subscription for, you know, quote unquote, doing nothing, right? You you sell, and Apple's rules forever have been, if you sell digital content in your app, you have to sell it with in-app purchase and you cannot link to your own website where you sell it, where you, where you also sell it. So not only do you have to use in-app purchase, you can't say, go to netflix.com and sign up there. They would let you price the subscription or the media more expensive in the app to offset the 30% revenue in, uh, revenue difference, right? So you could have, like Netflix could, if they wanted to, sell it in the app store for thirteen ninety nine when they sell their subscription for nine ninety nine on their website. But they said, you know, we're not doing this. We're not copyright with Apple. We're leaving the store. We don't want to give Apple 30% of our, of our income. Fine, that was their decision, right? They left. And that's basically been the status quo for every single app from every single company, full stop, right? Spotify is complaining about this now to the European Commission because obviously they're mad that they have to pay 30% of their subscriptions to Apple when Apple Music obviously doesn't have to pay 30% to themselves. But it's not like Spotify was being singled out as you have to pay 30% and no one else does. Everybody, everybody was paying 30% or not paying at all and not letting you sign up inside the app. This dates back to what, like 2011 with the Amazon Kindle app because in the very early stages of the iPad, the Kindle app let you buy books through the Kindle bookstore on the iPad directly. And then Apple was like, wait, we want to get some of that money because you're buying it in the app. So then they put out these rules that made it that outlawed it. And this is going back to 2010, 2011. So this is a decade now of these rules being instated. And ever since then, the Kindle app has just been a reader app, a library app, where you can see your books that you've purchased elsewhere from Amazon, but you can't actually buy them directly inside the Kindle. Mm -hmm. And there's no exceptions to that, right? Like, universal law. So now we zoom forward to 2020. And then randomly, yesterday, the Amazon Prime Video app suddenly let people start buying or renting films and TV shows without using Apple's in-app purchase. It would show your Amazon payment method. Now, if you go to apple.com, you find the App Store review guidelines, you can find clause 3.13, which specifically says, digital media must be bought with in-app purchase and you cannot use your own payment methods. There's, there's different rules for if it's a physical product, so that's why the Amazon shopping app, you can buy like, toilet paper or pens or whatever you want with your Amazon payment method because it's that's physical products. Apple didn't have any purview over physical products. Or if you're gifting to a charity, they're also exempt and they can go through their payment methods. But digital content, like movies, TV shows, books, games, blah, 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 always you have to go through net purchase. But then suddenly, out of the blue, Amazon Prime Video was letting people buy it not using app purchase. And then it stayed up for a few more minutes. It stayed up for a few more minutes. And there were questions, right? Because... The Amazon Prime Video app is, you know, part and parcel, a thin app around a website, right? Mm -hmm. Because they use the same JavaScript code base across iOS, Android, all these platforms. And so maybe it was just a bug and they were accidentally showing the Amazon checkout flow to iOS customers for a bit. Maybe they turned it on and they hadn't told Apple they were going to do it. So then we were waiting for some drama where the app got pulled. Maybe it was going to be some sort of special deal between Apple and Amazon. It really wasn't clear, right? It was, it was, and, the only thing that was clear was that it was not normal. It was like if Tim Cook walked in a Microsoft store and just sat down and started working. It, it was, it was different and we yeah, had no idea why. All, the core premise of all of these antitrust complaints against the app store is that Apple forces people to use Apple in at purchase. And that means that you're either giving Apple 30% of non-consumable products or 15% of subscription products after a year, 
right? Like, all of this stuff, whether you're talking about Netflix, Spotify, all of these complaints, Tile, right? There are other complaints that you can you can yield against the App Store as well, but the, co- the primary one when you get down to brass tacks, it's money, it's 30% of every purchase, right? So this is crazy. It is, like, literally unprecedented. We haven't seen this happen anywhere else. And so we were, like, flying around trying to work out what happened. And then we worked out that it was... You could actually buy stuff with internet purchase still. And the and the crux was, if you have an Amazon payment method set up on your Amazon account, it shows the Amazon checkout flow. So you're buying through Amazon. If you don't have any Amazon payment methods, it shows the Apple internet purchase sheet and you're buying through the App Store. Okay, so it's a bit more sane, right? It's not just entirely Amazon purchasing. Uh-huh. But still, that behavior would still be outlawed by the App Store on any normal day. And then, finally, we we got to the bottom of it because Apple released a statement to us and a few other people that announced that this was not a novel thing. This is a quote-unquote established program which allows certain companies to be able to opt to buy, rent movies and TV shows using the payment method tied to their existing video subscription. Okay, now... My immediate reaction was like, oh, they're trying to make this sound like it's n- not different, but it's definitely different. Like, yeah, like, uh, calling this an established program is a huge stretch of the truth, right? Like, they, they quote in this in this paragraph that... Previ- that current partners already included Altice One, which is a cable company, and Canal Plus, which is a French cable company. And we even, <laughs> we even got replies that said, I've been a Canal Plus subscriber forever, and I've never seen this. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, I guess technically this program existed, but these Altice One and Canal Plus are so minuscule in the scheme of the world, right, that even if they were doing this before, no one had ever noticed it. Before. I mean, we, we we heard from a reader who said, "I have Canal Plus, and I had no idea this existed that I, that, they, that they could do this." Isn't that so. what I just said? Yeah, yeah. I don't usually listen when you talk, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll forgive you. I'll forgive you. Okay, it's been five so, years. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listening to the other person—that's a that's a that's a piece of work. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> I just took a walk. Amazon Prime Video, right? Amazon is obviously. 10, 100, 1,000, a million times bigger than these tiny cable companies out here. Yeah. Plus. So this is essentially the start of a new normal where Apple gets to pick very, very, very small slice of the App Store market that are allowed to buy digital content using their own payment methods, not using in-app purchase. So yes, they call it an established program. It's basically a new initiative. What's interesting is that this program is basically, you know, essentially invite only. What Apple's full statement says that it's a program for premium subscription video entertainment providers to offer a variety of customer benefits like Apple TV app integration, AirPlay 2, TVOS app, Universal Search, Siri, and then single or zero sign-on integration as well. And then on qualifying premium video entertainment apps, Customers will have the option to buy or rent movies and TV shows using the payment method on their account. But basically, that means, you know, Apple is judge, jury, and executioner. They can choose whoever they want to participate in this program, right? Mm-hmm. And at least currently, it only applies to premium video apps only. And just last week, we were talking about the fact that the App Store outright bans game streaming services. <laughs> so. If you're so, it's like crazy at the moment. The, the current framework of the App Store means that depending on the media type that you sell as a catalog, it depends on how you get treated dramatically. If you're if you're a catalog of games, you're not allowed in the App Store at all. If you're a catalog of music like Spotify, you can be in the App Store, but you have to pay Apple thirty percent on every purchase, right? If you're most video apps, you have to pay Apple thirty percent on every purchase. But if you're a favored, blessed, premium subscription video entertainment provider. You don't have to comply with any of those restrictions. Yeah, it's like um, we, we, there was a moment of question, and forgive me if you've already mentioned this, uh, <laughs> but Kendall and Comixology are, are, are big examples from Amazon where you 
can't spend your money there directly. You've got to go out of the app and, and buy the content. Um, you, you can use tokens, which is a recent development, but um, you know there, there was a moment of hope there, well, or maybe these two things will also get this ability if they're if they worked out a deal with Amazon. And you've seen so much stuff with um, with Alexa and uh, well, and, and Apple Music and Apple Podcasts. Uh, control with, with Echo speakers. I feel like maybe the and then the TV app on on uh, Fire TV uh, sticks and boxes and cubes. Um, that that maybe they just have like an Amazon deal that would make all of this much easier for everybody. Uh, and, and the Amazon uh, retailer shop right to sell Apple products mm-hmm. first party. It, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of work going together there. Um, and and it, but that's not the case. That it, the case is that it. it I mean, it, it seems that it, they they specify TV not because. Uh, they don't think that this should be blocked like other media formats, but because Apple TV is coming from a disadvantage and they want to encourage all of those other things like AirPlay and and the search stuff. Um, but it does not answer the question of like, it seems like Netflix is a big opposition to being uh, in the TV app, for example, or being in uh, – it, it is that you know they want to control the experience and they can't do um, they, they can't say a, a subscription directly uh, even through the app it's got it's well without sharing money with Apple they've got to go around uh, they've got to go to their website and do that um, so why doesn't this incentive apply more widely you know like and, and if, if if the program exists and it's always been this way and we just didn't know about it then like you know why aren't there <laughs> isn't there a higher success rate of of, of yeah he's, you know? he's clearly brand new because there's basically only one partner <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah and, and well and just to, for a second like uh, just think about it as uh, something that's been around for five years like okay um hmm it's not working <laughs> you know they've only gotten uh three partners ever so there's got to be a better way if, if that's their end goal so then a, a solution would be to give you know, kind of piecemeal it out. We'll let let Netflix because they are major um, sell, but then require them to just be in one thing. You know, say you don't have to be in the TV app, but um, we want you know other things. They don't have AirPlay anymore. Uh, they're going backwards in that sense. Uh, not have all of these things required. So it's 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 a weird one. Like Kindle, there's there's no logical reason why the App Store should be more favorable to video content than ebooks or music or anything else right there's no like sense to it the the truth is apple wants to make wants to expand its its reach into video content and tv and so they've basically just said you know that even app store where everyone complies by the same rules well we're going to carve out this nice exception where video apps that we pick on our schedule can have much better financial terms Mm -hmm. right because because one way to read this statement is that to be to be able to offer an alternative payment method, you must integrate with the TV app, support AirPlay 2, make a TVOS app, integrate with Siri, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. But I I think this statement is a a bridged version of the truth because I think you could come to like I think a cable company could come to Apple and say, "Look, we're willing to integrate the TV app. We're willing to support AirPlay Two. We'll give you an Apple TV <laughs> yes. app. We'll support a universal search. We'll do everything you've just put on this little list. Can you? Can we use our own payment method?" And Apple would go, "No." What? Is, or they would go, "Look at look like, at Hulu. Like, isn't Hulu all those things?" Yes. <laughs> and you can't buy Hulu directly. Yeah, and and. If they could, they'd be snapping their arm off, right? Because it, it'd be pure win for Hulu. They'd be making more money for doing basically nothing, right? And they like, don't sell like content piece by piece, but they sell it as a subscription. Um, and and so is that where there's? But then the cable comp, like the the other two examples, they're they're not like Amazon Prime Video, where right, it's basically right. iTunes so, movies and TV shows. So Altis One and Canal Plus have deals with Apple to sell the Apple TV 4K as a cable box. Even more of like a special scenario. Exactly. Yeah. Right. This isn't like some open program where it's like, if you do these five things, we'll let you do this. It's, you know what? If we're feeling nice and we want to make <laughs> a deal with these select partners, we'll let you, you know, make some more money. And then maybe you can also integrate with the TV app. Like, I don't think it works like integrate the TV app, then you can be in this program. It's more like, we'll invite you to the program. And then if you want to, you can be part of the TV app, right? Like it's completely flipped on its head. And obviously Apple PR has done this nice statement where it sounds like the other way around. So then you go, oh, look, Netflix is evil. 
in reality, Apple is basically judged you an executioner and they're having no loss in this scenario because this is how it's going to work, right? So by default, every app has to give Apple 30%, right? Then just imagine random video app A. Video Random video app A becomes really popular, so popular that they don't need to sell directly to customers through their app on the app store they can they're so popular that they know people will sign up through the website so at that point they remove all purchasing through the app and they're only selling online right and so now apple is making zero percent from this person so at that point apple can go look we're now making zero money from this person if we entice them into this arrangement and get this deal we were making some money from in-app purchases rather than zero and so Basically, Apple has basically made another situation where it can make more money at its complete discretion, right? Like, I don't think this resolves any anti antitrust complaint or anti competition complaint. Or no, it makes it. It makes it. It, it uh, makes it worse. Yeah, on the surface, it's like, oh, Apple's being more open with with a major company, so it affects a lot of people. But actually, it makes it worse. It's like exactly. You're. you're <laughs> it, it makes everyone else is left out feel even worse, and even more of an example of how it's not an even playing field. Yeah. yeah, like if you're Eddie Q's best friend, now you can make a bit more money. But apart from that, you're in the same boat as everyone else. It's so now Amazon's got even more an advantage over Netflix in the App Store. Mm-hmm. Right? It's just caused more um, more inequality, right? Like before you could make an argument that Apple applies the same rules to everyone. So at least that's kind of fair, right? But now it's like for Apple's just own internal strategic games, they can make whatever partnerships they want with whoever they want. To give them a different deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, the one thing that applies to me here is that I use the Fire TV stick and then the Fire TV cube on the TVs in our house um, because you get Google, uh, you, you get YouTube in 4K, um, you get voice control from the box with the cube. And um, those, those are two things that, that Apple hasn't done yet. or They've not worked out a deal to get 4K at YouTube because of the, the format issue. And then they've not done a, a box that uh, either has Siri built in or integrates deeply with with uh, the HomePod so that you can just speak into the air and control your TV. Um, and it's those two things are not perfect because, I mean, they're, they've got the Amazon um, kind of like threshold for design where it's not pretty and it's the, the UI is like usable, but it, you see a lot of sponsored stuff too. But it's, it's as painful as that is. It's worth it for me to have the 4K YouTube content because you can have an Apple TV 4K with a 4K TV and not get Apple you know, get get YouTube in 4K, um, and and so and you've also got the TV app now, so it's just there's very little that you give up in that scenario. Um, what you can't do is on the Apple TV app you can browse the iTunes Store to see movies and TV shows, and I think you can like add them to your up next list. But you mm-hmm. can't buy them there. There's a button that says um, how to purchase, I think, and you click it, and it tells you, you know, everywhere that you can make purchases from the iTunes store, which isn't the box. And I, I have to imagine that it's some part of the scenario, you know, uh, of their established program. There, you, you will, you will soon see the ability to purchase uh, movies and TV shows on the Apple TV app on Fire uh, TV and Fire Cube. Uh, and it's still a, so it wouldn't solve it everywhere else, you know, with all the built-in apps and on um, other de- other devices like Roku. But you know, why not now? Because it's, it's the equivalent of what they're Roku doing. Roku lets you buy it through them, by the way. Okay, because they don't take a cut. They Roku has a funny business model where they take a cut of advertising in an app, but if you just sell something, you keep all of the money. Yep, yep. Which makes no sense, right? But that's so. So on the Apple TV app on Roku, you can buy through the iTunes Store. Yeah, anything you want. Yeah. Hey, let's pause for a second. I'm going to do a story real quick. Oh. When people saw this news come out, I think a lot of them saw it as like a relaxing and Apple doing like a favor to the world and or, or at least to, you know, the companies that are video apps i really don't see it like that like i think this is just a way that apple has optimized its processes to make more money from service revenue because they're they've got a new avenue now to extract at least some money from big apps that were previously giving them nothing at all so i don't think this helps them with the anti-competitive argument and i don't think it makes it fairer for everyone and 
it definitely doesn't seem like this program is something that's going to be rolled out widely to a lot of developers. It's going to remain like, you know, a gentleman's members club type arrangement where Apple only picks places where it's, you know, it really makes sense strategic to them. And you know, it's fine. Apple's a business. It does great as an indie developer that now it really feels like there are many stilted tiers of the store. But customers, it's good, obviously, because it was stupid that you couldn't buy stuff inside the Amazon app. So there is customer benefit. It's not like, you know, optimizing for profit and at the expense of customers. It's more like optimizing for profit at the expense of developers that aren't, you know, multi-billion dollar companies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how long until Netflix does this? Well, <laughs> it's, it's, I, it's this I, new established, it's long established program. Yeah, this long established program that started this week. You have to think they're now renegotiating, right? Mm. You have to think so. And I would expect that Apple is also <laughs> newly establishing <laughs> established programs <laughs> for other media types as well. Mm-hmm. That'd like be good. Music, yeah. right? Because if they can get Spotify to agree to something like this, then a lot of the monopoly pressure disappears. Like Spotify yeah. is by far the one that's been shouting loudest and complaining the most. And technically, these policies are more anti-competitive than not right mm-hmm. but if you can wipe out the people complaining about it then you know you're probably achieving the same result yeah and at the end of the day this there's, there's so much complexity in like why this is important because it's this very simple thing to just look at and see um but but zoom way out and it's just good for users i mean you, you know you can you, <laughs> when when the prime video app came to apple tv it was like you could ask to see content uh, and you'd see just so much stuff that wasn't included in your Prime Video subscription that you had to purchase. Um, so it, it could it could seek it out, but it was mixed in. It was like if there was no um, wall between the TV Plus subscription and then the the iTunes movies and TV uh, store, like like the page one of the Apple TV app, you know, um, where it's like, oh, you have it, but you you don't really have it. You got to buy it. So um, now, and, and you can't buy it from the device. So now now that you can actually com- complete the process and buy it from the device if you need to. Yeah, and I definitely think you're right in that Apple has enough leverage in this argument to force Amazon to let it buy stuff on its platform. It's just probably a matter of time there for it to be released. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. We are sponsored this week by Pillow. Getting a good night's sleep is underrated, but with a little help, it can be life-changing. Pillow is an all-in-one sleep tracking solution to help you be more aware of your sleep patterns and discover what might be affecting your sleep quality. If you have an Apple Watch, tracking your sleep is as easy as wearing it to bed. Pillow will track and analyze your sleep automatically. One of Pillow's most loved features is the ability to get a detailed heart rate diagram of every sleep session. You can compare your sleep quality with your weight, steps, caffeine consumption, and many other health metrics to discover how they might be affecting how you sleep. You can enable recording and Pillow will save the sounds that you make during sleep. That means you can find out about sleep talking, sleep apnea, snoring, other random unexpected noises that might be keeping you up and affecting a good night's sleep. And a lot of users have tried this out and been surprised by the results. Now, Pillow is very privacy-minded. All of your sleep and audio data is encrypted and stored on your device. When it syncs to iCloud, it's using end-to-end encryption. Pillow doesn't have user accounts, you can use it anonymously, and it doesn't collect or send your personal data anywhere else. Now, naps can boost your focus and your creativity and your overall well-being. And if you're working from home, you can also take naps using Pillow's power nap modes. If you need an alarm, Pillow can wake you up using your iPhone watch or iPad. If you have WatchOS 6 installed on your Apple Watch, the latest updated Pillow uses the new extended runtime features to minimize battery consumption too. Pillow is available in the App Store for the iPhone, Apple Watch, and iPad. Discover all of Pillow's features and download the app at nabox.com slash pillow. That's spell N-E-Y-B-O-X dot com slash pillow. Sleep well and stay safe. Our thanks to Pillow for their support of 9to5Mac Happy Hour. Let's talk about uh, a couple of things here. Well, I guess the question to you, Mayo, do you want to talk about the new story that we just ran in the middle of the podcast? You can, yeah, if you can bring that up. Go okay, okay, I'll bring it up. And so uh, what that story is, is that 95 mac has received new reliable information 
on the so-called iPhone 9. And this is the iPhone 8 replacement, hence 9 as the, the reference there, uh, except that it's it's sort of taking the role of the iPhone SE did in 2016, where you've got an old case design with, with you know vastly improved internals to make it as modern as the, as the new lineup. Um, and so what we can confirm is that, you know, A, Apple's already to release this thing. So it's either already out by now, like you, like you know, or we can um, expect to see it early next week, not like mid month, but early next week. And um, also that, that there are three colors. Uh, this, 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 this part corroborates reporting from Ming-Chi Kuo last October that there'd be a dark version. So black, like the, um, like you see with the, um, well, the 10R you're used to. And, and, or the iPhone 11 right now. Or the iPhone 11 right now, and then white. And so not quite space green and silver, but they've got like just actually like black glass and, and white glass with the um, tinted uh, aluminum bands. And then red, so product red from the start. And so we saw the iPhone 8 in product red mid-cycle, right? And so right. this is the S, this is what we, what we now know will be called the, the iPhone SE, again, it's just the 2020 version instead of the 2016 version, and it will come in red from day one as well. And something interesting is that Ming-Chi Kuo had reported in October that there would be two storage options starting from, from, from $399, 64 gigabytes, and then 120 gigabytes. And what we've learned is that we, we totally expect to see a 256 gigabyte option as well. Um, we can't confirm the pricing, but if we look at what Quo believed, you know, say 400, you can imagine just adding 100 bucks to that as you go. And, um, you know, 256 gigabytes is, is uh, that'll, that'll last for a while. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, and then we we also, uh, we've got details in the story, if, if, if this isn't already out yet, about the different case colors as well. So, so two silicon cases and three leather cases. And um, from what we can tell, I mean, this 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 is... This looks imminent. I mean, and 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 also, we we already expect some things from this. So earlier this week, we reported that uh, the, the new iPhone will have um, the uh, it, it will support the future feature with with car key, where you can use it to replace your car keys. And um, what's the other feature that's in this? That that uh, Express Transit. Express Transit. So there's and what's interesting there is this is a Touch ID phone, so not Face ID, but a Touch ID. And so far, every Express Transit phone, I believe, is a Face ID phone. This will be a Touch ID phone with that feature. And that's the feature where you can use your iPhone to, you know, use the subway system. Even if your iPhone dies, you've got some reserve in there that's just intended for that purpose only. Um, and it was not in the iPhone 8, and so it will be in the iPhone SE. And... Um, and then we also, just based on early reporting, we believe that this is, will not have 3D Touch like the iPhone 10R, 11, 11 Pro, and 11 Pro Max. It'll use that instead, we imagine, for battery life. So that would be one of the uh, also improvements from the iPhone 8 is that, hey, this is the new iPhone SE. The 8's gone, and you get way more battery life than you got with the 8, just like you did when you went from the iPhone 10s to the iPhone 11 Pro. Same design, remove 3D Touch inside, more room for battery. There you go. Um, so that, that's that's our new reporting. It's either um, already an announcement from Apple, or if it's not, then you can expect it early it's next very, week. Very, 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 very soon. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Uh, and we had to actually pause the show and like write it up <laughs> as we were recording the episode. So um, there you go. The other thing is is um, about that tile competitor, the AirTag device. So tell me what's what's going on there this week. Yeah. So in obviously we've done loads of reporting about the AirTags for more than a year. Generally, the consensus is Apple was trying to ship them for the holiday season last year, which is why the iPhone 11 had the U1 chip in it so that they could work together and Apple could sell the iPhone 11 and iPhone Pro and then maybe sell some of the you know, AirTag accessories at the same time. Obviously, that didn't happen. Uh, but you know, imminently, we think that these tags are going to come out like this month, June, before the end of the year, right? Like, And to add fuel to that fire, the Apple support account on YouTube uploaded a video about erasing your device and so that involved turning off find my iphone and if you look carefully at the screenshot the uh, page with the find my iphone settings under the enable offline finding option which is the thing they introduced last year which allows you to find devices without actually having to like have active gps it uses it like um, beacons through other devices nearby mm-hmm. the just desc- the little subtitle description of the uh 
like the off, like offline finding devices. So you get the fun my iPhone feature you turn on or off. And there's also another one to participate in that, like the network of iPhones if your phone's yes, off. Yes, yeah. yeah. So the the yeah. private encrypted, you know, nodal network, find my yeah. network thing where like an iPad without wi without Wi Fi could technically be found because it would ping a little Bluetooth signal to an iPhone that walks past it and then it could, you know, route back to you. Mm -hmm. And so the description obviously on the current builds of iOS does not mention air tags, but on this Apple support video it says offline finding enables this device and air tags to be found when not connected to Wi Fi or cellular. So at least whatever random build internal build that Apple support account uses to make its tutorial videos that assumes that the air tags are already out. This reminds me a lot of the uh, screenshot we found a few months ago, where the <laughs> where it was the Apple Watch um, alarms app, and it mentioned it talked about the sleep app that also doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just another indicator that these air tags were probably meant to already be out, and <laughs> they're coming out soon. -ish. Yeah. Our friend uh, Stephen Chatton Smith had a fun tweet, which is that. Um, his read on just the leak happening at all is that because it's been out in the open for over a year now, I mean, it was previous, it was prior to WWDC last year that um, uh, Rambo found it for Android Mac last year. Um, that, that it's been so like, and then the marketing name later on that air tag as a thing in the public domain has been so present that it's easy for someone in the video team to just overlook it as something to hide. <laughs> it's like, Oh, that, yeah, that's, everyone knows about those, and turns out, no, they haven't launched I'm yet. I'm kind of surprised that the Apple Support YouTube video team uses internal builds at all. You'd think they just use, like, the public releases. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but clearly they don't, you know. Yeah. Maybe, they, maybe they're specialized for some purpose, too, that they're not the public versions. You know? They might have, like, um, you know, like, uh, some of the notifications are all disabled, the carrier names are blanked out, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, some just content so. populated, but, you know. Yeah, behaviors. just so it's ready for video, right? So there's no, like, random iCloud account information anywhere and stuff. Yeah. yeah. But but it is funny to have that happen to a publicly facing version of iOS, because, you know, you have to plan for those to be out in public, too. So it's a very interesting, like, oh, accident to happen in public. Yeah, and about five minutes after it was all posted everywhere, Apple remove the video from public consumption <laughs> yeah it was marked as private which makes me like you think it was like scheduled maybe you know or they just plan to put it out there when when this new iphone is out there too or or, or well not i guess it wouldn't be tied to the iphone unless they release these with the with the iphone as like a together thing but yeah it's, i mean that'd be cool that would I'm, be cool <laughs> i'm down to buy like one air tag the, the right. price is it's like such a make or break thing for this because we've talked at length about what they will do and what the appeal is and it is there's some interesting stuff there but it you know we were talking before the podcast you know what's your how many would you buy for 50 how many would you buy for 80 dollars and the answer quickly becomes 80 bucks one for work and that's it like just because we can talk about it and write stories about it but <laughs> You're not gonna. It, it, you could come to a point where the thing that you put it on is not worth the thing that you're you're using to track. You know, you you can't track something that costs you fifty bucks to replace with an eighty dollar tag. Yeah, um, then you need a tag to look after your tag. Yeah, you need like a tile, like a cheap tile for your <laughs> pricey tag. Your tag. <laughs> so make sure I don't lose my ninety nine dollar air tag. I've got a twenty dollar tile attached. To it. <laughs> exactly. Um, but if, I mean, if they're cheap, then I can, I can imagine, uh, or, or if they're, you know, relatively affordable, then I can imagine some good applications. One thing I was looking at, we had someone email us during the show too, that, that, um, just as the concept is useful for pets that you put one on the pet's collar. I'm sure that's something we've talked about before. And I was actually looking at something like that because, um, my dog Apollo is now, he's, he's been an inside dog for this whole year. But we finally finished the fencing in the backyard. And so now he gets to stay outside all day long and then come in at night. And he loves it. And I'm a little bit paranoid that he's going to like dig out and get away. Um, whereas in the house, I was not worried. And so I, I was looking at, you know, a trackers. I won't buy a towel right now until we know what Apple's thing is. But then there's this other category of GPS enabled collars with LTE. So importantly, if you can't get a GPS, you know, ping, um, there's LTE, and if you want to communicate that to something that's not near you, you know, you, you've got LTE to communicate it to you. So that's more sophisticated than than what a one of these tiles would do, I think, or air tags would do. But you also, you know, you pay more for it, and you pay a fee for that service. Um, but then for other things like just your keys, man. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> on one hand, we're seeing Apple make something that you put on your keys to track, 
uh, if they get lost, on the other hand, we're seeing them like replace car keys with your iPhone and Apple Watch with car key feature. Um, yeah, or maybe like you put it in your wallet so you don't lose, you know, your money and stuff, or you put it in your luggage, you put it in your laptop bag, like. That's why I kind of think it's specialized enough that Apple is probably going to go for a more premium product that you only sure, buy like yeah. one or two of, and you put on your like you know really expensive valuables. Whereas obviously tiles only business is selling trackers, so they have really cheaper ones that they want you to buy like ten of. Plus now they have the tile subscription service and all that stuff. But as we talked about before, Apple's tile is functionally more capable than the tile tracker, and it includes like stuff like ultra wideband that the tile trackers don't have at all at the moment. And so basically, my like benchmark for the air tax prices i looked at the most expensive air, air tile that they sell and that sells for 30 pounds which is about 35 dollars right and then i was like yeah put 15 dollars on that when it comes to 50 that sounds like a round number so <laughs> i'm kind of like working on a benchmark of that the air tags gonna be around 50 dollars ish and uh, and you know at 50 dollars I'd, I'd buy one or two and use them i'm not going to buy like 20 right but there's you know specific places where they might come in handy uh or, and, and like you know for instance on your keys right because the reality is, even if you do have a car key in the future, you're still going to have keys because you've got to get in your door, right? At the very yeah. least, you're going to have to get Well, I don't, I don't have a so. key for my door either. <laughs> it's a home kit lock with a passcode on it. On the, on you the, know what I mean. You right? cannot put like, a key in the door. <laughs> if I replace yeah, my car Every single yeah. person is going to have something that they want to make sure they don't lose. Like yeah. a laptop bag is a good example. Sure, yeah. Or luggage or your keys or whatever. Yeah. The- and so, say if Apple worked it out that, oh, if we can sell someone an AirTag like... You know, once every two years, you know that's like a hundred dollars of additional revenue every two years, right? Like, mm-hmm. I think that's a business that they'd be interested in nothing to do. I really hope they don't have a subscription service as part of this, like what Tile does, because I don't think it'd be worth it at that point. Uh, Apple will never do a subscription service, man. Yeah, never, about? never. Yeah. I, and and to be honest, even the fifty dollars price point, I'm kind of doubting. My guess is being maybe too low. Like, oh no, Steve Trout and Smith made a good point that. Apple sells because because we expect this thing to have a cell battery, right? The little circular battery, and Apple sells a product for that today for twenty five dollars, and that's the completely inert old Apple TV remote <laughs> that is just like a slick a piece of aluminium with four buttons on it, mm-hmm. and that sells for twenty five dollars. So maybe fifty dollars is too cheap. I don't know. Yeah, but, I'm looking at Tiles prices right now, and they have the the, the mate like the basic one for twenty five bucks. Um, they, they, and like you mentioned, the pro is 35 bucks or you can buy two for 60 and save $10 or buy four for a hundred and save $40. They've also got this sticker, which is like, it's like a, a very slimmer version of, of, of their tracker. And that's the one that's like, has like a premium price to it because it's so small and that's 40 bucks. So you can imagine apples being sleek and, you know, maybe more like the sticker and form factor and being tiny. And and then you so then say forty bucks add apples premium to that <laughs> and then you're double it eighty dollars yeah eighty dollars <laughs> it's terrible but okay we'll see we'll see there yeah like I and I I don't think you'd find people buy more than like one of them but at eighty dollars I think it could probably be a successful product right yeah the classic slightly too expensive probably but useful if you know what I mean I mean I I don't I don't know that Apple's known to be doing these combo packs but then. Uh, it's it's actually two for eight for forty dollars from Tile, so they don't let you buy just one of those stickers. It's in it's in two packs. Uh, okay, so then maybe it could be one for fifty. Yeah, and then if you buy four, you get them for sixty, and so that's that's twenty bucks off. So, and you know, maybe Apple could do these in packs like that, where like you can't buy more than you can't just buy one. You have to buy a pack of three. And they're sixty bucks, or, you know. That that would be compelling. No, Apple's pack of three be a hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh no. But, eh, we'll see. It, it's, this is one of the things that, like, the product in general. Like, if you just described it, it's kind of mundane. Like, it's a tracker. Trackers exist. You don't necessarily have to have one. It solves a small inconvenience that you've managed to live with this whole time. Otherwise, uh, it's it's mostly interesting because it's from Apple, and then how it interacts uh, with the network of iPhones. Um, but then the thing that really makes it so interesting is that it's been over a year that we've been talking about this thing and it went from just far fetched to any day now, you know, was in terms of how, how, you know, it's been so long and that it's still in development. For, for sure. Yeah. I think it's cool. Like I, I know it is kind of like obviously mundane in the scheme of things, but the, 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 the particular implementation that Apple's doing is quite cool with the UWB integration and everything. Like, if they were literally just cloning a tile and putting it out, like, who cares, right? But mm, yeah. there is actually some, you know, special source there that would be interesting to see. 
We are sponsored this week by SaneBox, the easiest way to get your email under control and hit that magic inbox zero. If email is an overwhelming mess for you, like it is for so many, SaneBox is the tool that you need to use. SaneBox uses artificial intelligence to monitor your inbox, making sure you see the important emails and aren't distracted by the rest. As messages hit your inbox, SaneBox does the triage for you. Important emails stay in your inbox and everything else is put into your Sane Later folder for you to peruse at your convenience. It makes it super easy to separate the email that you need to immediately pay attention to and what stuff you can get to later. And even better, you don't need to use a special app or a weird plugin to use the SaneBox service. One of the best features of SaneBox is the black hole. Do you have an annoying sender? It just keeps emailing you. Maybe it's a brand that refuses to stop messaging you no matter how many times you click unsubscribe. We'll just drag a message to the same black hole folder and you'll never have to hear from that sender again. Done. Let's say, alternatively, that you've got some a sender that you just need to keep tabs on their reply, like you've sent a message to them and you want to know and you want to be reminded when they come back to you. The same reminders feature will watch to see if they reply and if they don't, by a date that you specify, SaneBox alerts you so that you can follow up with them in a natural way. SaneBox works with every single email server or service that has ever been created. There's nothing to learn and nothing to install. See it for yourself by visiting sanebox.com slash 9to5mac where you can get a two-week free trial and a $25 credit. That's spelled S-A-N-E-B-O-X dot com slash number 9 T-O number 5 Mac. Samebox.com slash 9to5Mac. Our thanks to Samebox for their support of Happy Hour. Also, this 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 is a busy Apple week for stories because um, we've we talked for so long already, and now we're finally getting to Apple's acquisition of Dark Sky, which, wow, that was a surprise. That came out of left field. Um, but it was just... It was, <laughs> It was on uh, March 31st, not quite April 1st, which is April Fool's Day and the anniversary of Apple as a company, I think 44 years now. Um, but but the the eve of that, and totally serious, uh, Dark Sky announced that they were bought by Apple. They are no longer supporting their Android app, which is fairly new, but people liked it. And, and it had millions of downloads. Millions of downloads, popular. yeah. And then um, I saw one, one report that says like half of their downloads were that. Um, and I think that app was like free with ads and then you can subscribe to remove them maybe. And then the iPhone one's always been four bucks with no ads, no subscription. So of course the the free one will have, you know, a lot of downloads compared to the the, the paid one. Um, even though it's not as, not as old, but then the, I think the bigger thing in you know, Android app, whatever, but the bigger thing is that the API that a lot of iOS apps use as a data source, either the only data source or an option is going away by the end of 2021. And, um, you know, that that's going to affect, I think, maybe more people than, than the Android app that does. Uh, but, you know, within minutes of being bought, you know, or the announcement dropping, the app moved from the Dark Sky App Store account to Apple's App Store account. And then they had, like, the... They have a section in the app for like forecast alert or weather alerts, like extreme heat, you know, or flooding, and that became uh, dark sky is now with Apple or something like that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the first time you launch it, it says you now you're now subscribed to Apple's privacy policy. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I had a, a the last push alert I have from Dark Sky is that I have to update to continue receiving alerts, and I guess it's you know because of the acquisition and the privacy policy. Um, it's interesting. Like, why did they buy Dark Sky? You know, it, this is one of the apps where, in this week, where I'm kind of nostalgic about my time at 95 Mac so far. Um, one of the early stories that I wrote was about Dark Sky, and I recall pitching. It was like in May 2013, um, and so it was only like a month in the job or so. And I remember pitching it as like, "Hey, I want to write about this app update," and it was like UK support for Dark Sky was the main thing. And um, I I recall like back in I guess we used HipChat at the time. A little bit of pushback of like never heard of it, <laughs> you know. And it was <laughs> it was version three of the app, so it you know it wasn't brand new, um, but it just wasn't known by everybody. And by the time this was announced yesterday, like everyone on Twitter had a, you know some opinion about it because it's something that we at least know about. I mean, it's been in Apple commercials, especially the watch early watch uh, commercials would show you know receiving an alert on your watch about it's going to rain soon. 
And Dark Sky's like trick is that it, it's it's hyper local weather, so you know not just your city, but like around you. And um, the alerts are for if it's going to start uh, raining or snowing within you know the next few minutes, so that you know to plan before you go outside. Or if you're stuck in a storm, you can look at the app. Uh, and you can even receive alerts for that, that the downpour will soon stop, you know, and it kind of gives you the window of like when, you know, it's not going to rain anymore. Uh, and that's like the big thing is, is, is that they do forecast and everything else too. But I think the most important thing for this story is that they, they're their own weather source. You know, they're, they're a data provider for other apps and their own. Yeah, they, they collect like raw data from these like government sources, mm -hmm. which have crazy, like, completely inhumane apis that like you have to wrangle in five ways to sunday to make them work and they like ingest all of that reformat it make their pred weather predictions like the rain precip precipitation stuff and then they resell that through the api which then loads of other clients use yeah so they call it their, their homegrown data source and um apple has relied on most recently the weather channel for their data in the weather app the weather app is is not updated very frequently. So you've got the iOS 7 version, which was like a facelift, you know, skin change for the iOS 6 version. Then and it was it was a good change, but the only thing that's been changed since then is like you get, um, I, get I think like wind speeds and stuff like that are different. Air quality. Air quality, yeah. yeah so just, just some more data sources. And your big annoyance is that whenever you ask your HomePod for the weather, what does it tell you every few times? Yeah, so about one in five times it will say, this weather information is provided to you by the Weather Channel. <laughs> Thank you. And so, like, yeah, it just feels like an ad. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, go away. Do you have the weather? Is like, is the Weather Channel like? Is that a channel in the UK that you can tune into? The Weather Channel, I don't believe, is a channel. Okay, because it it's a it's a channel on I think cable TV in the US. So, yeah. But, but, you know, they've had a lot of issues as a data provider in apps that are about, uh, you know, privacy and like, you know, selling data mining and selling it off, you know, so that's, that's been. Like weather apps in general have a bad reputation for being a bit slimy and selling your data and sharing your location with loads of third party yeah. companies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why do you think they bought Dark Sky then? Do you think they just bought it to replace the weather the 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 third party data source they currently use with their own i, I hope it's more ambitious than that i mean I, I wrote a story that's like you know thoughts on this and, and what can come and um you know a few things to it it's like you you at least you know like a couple of a couple of people on the team anyway so it's a very small team it's not an aqua hire where you hire just the engineers to work on like the weather app going forward they want the data too you know, otherwise they could maybe sell Dark Sky to somebody else or something. I don't know. But um, it seems to be that they also want not just the engineers, but, but the product. Uh, and and that, you know, by by continuing to sell Dark Sky for four bucks on the App Store today, uh, they you know, that, that kind of further you know, tells you that. Then... Then, then what can what can happen next? You know, I think it, it, it's like a timeline. You know, the, the easiest thing to do is to replace the Weather Channel and have your, your own... You know, you can say provided by Dark Sky if you want to, or you can just not say where, and it's Apple's data provider. Um, and that seems to be like I don't know if it'd be a hard task, but I just imagine that it's it's changing out where you get your data, and it populates the app. Um, they, they do have a problem where um, Dark Sky is like focused on the US and the UK, and their data for the rest of the world is very patchy or not very reliable and not very good. Yeah, and, and you could see them continuing to use other sources around the world like um, is the weather channel the best one for every region in the u.s or, or not in the u.s in the world or is it, is it does it vary by uh by i think region? they use a couple like china has a different one for instance yeah so i could see them seeing you know like they, they are totally okay with having services that are only available in the u.s uk and australia for example um yep. you know in this case it's like the u.s and the uk and i'm not sure if there's anywhere else it's like you can you could you can use the service but it's not uh, as good so it could be based on region. Um, then, then there's a the thing of like, well, they don't, they don't. <laughs> Dark Sky has an app everywhere. It's on the uh, iPhone, Apple Watch, iPad, and then they have a website for the Mac, which which will go away by the end of next year, I believe. It sounds like um, that that gives them the next year and a half to 
recreate Apple's weather app for those platforms too. And instead of being a website, it'd be a Mac app and it would most certainly be a Mac Catalyst app ported from the iPad. Uh, I don't think that what you'd see is like the weather app go away and now Dark Sky, the app is like the new weather app and they just call it weather because it's, 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 it's not a, it's too much of a compromise in terms of like, you know, what you get from it and the design and everything. Um, yeah, Dark Sky's current app is not. Like it's very custom, it's very weird, right? And like, it it didn't benefit from the iOS seven transition either. Like, I think it was much clearer to read. It, it had the goals of iOS seven, where there's like clarity and no confusion about like what's content and what's information and everything, and uh, and what's just designed for the look of it. But but it it, it was harder to use after iOS seven. They um, went very over the top on like the blurs, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, abstract and concepts. Yeah. Like this yeah, I think what you see is. Obviously, nothing's going to happen this year. Like, iOS 14 will have no, no changes. Well, well right? why can't iOS 14 have the, the behind-the-scenes data provider change? In, I, I in... think it's too late already. Like, we saw shortcuts get acquired about this time in 2017, and then nothing happened until 2018, when literally they just started including the shortcuts app. Basically, just re- they just renamed Workflow to shortcuts and start including it on the iOS with basically no other changes, right? Like... It wasn't like they added a load of features in the first year. They basically just added the app. But you could have said that's hardly any work where they knew the year before. Well, I think that the, the time's run out. We talked about before, like how the betas of iOS 14 are getting frozen in like three weeks' time, right? Four weeks' time. This acquisition clearly has just started now and, you know, presumably is closing soonish because there isn't going to be any, com- any competitive concerns by regulators. Mm. But we are in the middle of like this crisis where no one can leave their houses. Mm. And so. You're going to need these people to interface with the engineers that currently work on the weather app. There's going to be loads of infrastructure changes to actually change the data source. Like Dark Sky is probably going to, if you just you know wholesale switch the API over, the millions and millions and millions of iOS users are probably going to overload the current Dark Sky servers. That needs a lot of preparation. I don't think it's something they can quickly do, like in the space of a month. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, and then then you have the problems of all the international issues, right? I I fully expect them to transition to the Dark Sky data source, you know, rebranded under the Apple umbrella. I, I, I don't think it's going to happen in 40.0 and I doubt it would happen this year. Mm, yeah. I think the, I think the, I think the cogs move too slowly to make it work. Like, they bought Beats in 2013. We didn't see that come to Apple Music till 2015. That's way harder though. That's, that's much harder, I think. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's hard, but Shortcuts, I think, is a good example where, like, what they did in the first, in the, a year later, they, you know, intuitively they probably could have just done it in the first year but they didn't right? yeah yeah so i i think it's too i think i think it's too late simply like beta one of ios 14 is close to done mm, yeah that's just that's just the truth <laughs> yeah I, I i don't see this it's it's i think it's much easier than shortcuts because shortcuts is like integration throughout the system and but the first year they had very little integration mm, yeah they literally just like took the app and just plonked it over there <laughs> like i just made it installed by default pre-install it yeah yeah uh, we, i mean they could certainly do that here um i would say i also had a thought that maybe there's there's you know what's in 14 is what's in 14 now and that um you know if you if you want to make it like more feature rich then an acquisition is a way to do that in the short in sports and you can have like a 14.1 or two that that shows us this by the end of the year or like, early say, next like, year I- because you, but you can also make the argument that like, you know, if, say if Apple wanted to redesign the app for iOS fourteen, they'd have bought Dark Sky last year, mm. right? Like it feels way too late to like, oh, oh, we're scrambling. Let's just build buy this app, and then somehow we're going to change the data sources over in like a month's time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like we're already seeing how much their production schedules are messed up, and their <laughs> development things are all wonky at the moment, just by completely external factors. Like I think integration of acquisition is. You know, it's not a non. It's not a thing that you just do in like a day, right? Yeah, like, maybe. It's probably a lot of stuff though. Yeah, the other thing is, um, you know, is is so I ask some people that are developers like you, um, you know, what do you want from this acquisition? Like, what would it mean for you? And the the main thing that I got was um, that there there are a number of developers who 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 could use a third-party weather provider, but they don't want to have any third-party 
APIs because of privacy reasons, and it's just more complicated. And that's kind of their policy as an app is that it's privacy focused. And if they could say that that, that Apple's the weather provider, then they would write features that they couldn't otherwise or otherwise without having some third party, um, you know, involved. And so, you know, and I, I, you know, it's, I think it's certainly too soon to see that, but, but this, this idea of like a weather kit API from Apple in a, in the future, you know, with iOS 15 or, you know, you know, I, I can't roll out something big in like the, the 0.3 versions that come out the previous, the, the next year, you know, I mean, look at cursor support. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I mean, 0.3 is fine. Like that's far <laughs> enough away that I think okay. they could actually start doing something like yeah. changing the data sort of stuff, but 40.0, 40.1, no, no chance. <laughs> Yep. So that's I, my forecast. That's your forecast. I mean, I, I I did have some. I think the last line. I'm like, I was I was not in a good mood. Um, perhaps a blue sky scenario like that could be in the forecast for a future version of Apple's development tools. So, like, I think it's great that they're clearly investing in the weather application because I mean, it has it, kind it, of it's a nothing. major category that's just tarnished with privacy issues. Yeah, and the as well as just like. You know, re-implementing the UI and adding a few more features. The the hyper local like rain notifications are something that you know is pretty cool in, when it works in Dark Sky, and you can imagine it's being a huge customer facing feature like that they could promote from you know all week long to people like upgrade to iOS fifteen and you can get told when it's about to rain because most people have never heard that it's even a thing they can do right like so it would be brand new to so many people in the world that like wow I can now get my phone to tell me when it's about to rain this is like magic and you can imagine integrations with apple maps as well maybe they can put like the rain forecast on the map right like weather layers there you can imagine siri could like prompt you that it's going to rain so maybe you want to leave for work slightly earlier like there's a huge scope there for them to integrate that stuff like and and even in the original siri adverts in like 2011 one of the questions they'd always show is like is it going to rain tomorrow? Mm-hmm. And you just get like the forecast for tomorrow, and you'd be like, "It looks like you need an umbrella." Like they could impl- like amplify that up so much with you know the dark sky information, and yeah, it probably would start exclusively in like the United States, and then they can slowly roll it over to other places over time. But that's exactly what they're doing with maps, right? They re you know they redid exactly, the map yeah. for the US last year, and now they're very slowly expanding it to other countries. I mean, Apple wants to own the stack, and and I, I mentioned the maps thing in my story because, like, you know, there are features that you couldn't do with Apple Maps without making you know a tough negotiation with Google, turn between directions, um, eventually offline maps. You know, you can't even do that with your other map partners, um, and so that will be coming. When you know, we we believe once Apple you know has their full map complete or you know some future ios version i guess but um yeah there's things that you could do with data that once you own it that you know you can have more features just based on that alone and we already and you could get rid of the dumb advertising in (laughs) siri and the little and when you scroll to the bottom of the widgets view on ios it says your weather information is provided the weather channel like Mm -hmm. surely johnny ive and the top designers at apple must hate having that line there Mm -hmm. like obviously johnny ive doesn't wear that anymore but you know what i mean like he has to use the faster just, software. <laughs> you got um like it just they're they're like a trillion dollar company and they have to have like an advertisement for the weather channel on the second home screen of the of the the billion devices sold. Like it just feels bad. So even if all they did with this, you know, and it doesn't seem like they spent a lot of money in Dark Sky, so it probably they're probably gonna make the money back on the acquisition just in the reduction of fee licensing fees that they have to pay to the Weather Channel currently, right? So mm-hmm. it probably makes sense financially as well as everything else. But even if all they did was just get rid of that little like one sentence, it would be so worth it. Maybe that's why you've you've not able you've not been able to put um widgets on the home screen yet, and it's that they're waiting for you to get rid of that banner and then it's 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 the game over. You can put widgets wherever you want them. <laughs> Yeah, the next one to to fall would be the Yahoo Finance thing for the stocks widget. That's another. Yeah, I'm I'm interested in that because we, we discussed that a little bit. It's like you know, my guess was like surely they could replace that with their own data, and 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 that Yahoo is the middleman because wasn't Yahoo a weather provider too? Or before it was literally the Weather Channel. Um, I guess there was some business change behind the scenes. Yeah. yeah, but I guess um, what you were saying is that that Yahoo. What they're doing with, with stock information is is at least a big part of their business, and so they're, they're a competent <laughs> source there. Yeah, I do think there is like they're just not just they're not just like a rebrand. They're actually like doing something. If you mm-hmm. know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and it's gonna and like Apple couldn't buy like 
the Yahoo Finance division only. If you see it, they'd have to buy Yahoo. So that's unfeasible, right? So mm-hmm. maybe there's an equivalent to Dark Sky in the world that's kind of does the same thing for stocks and they can snap them up to tune two. Yeah, I'm curious it's- about the, you know, the app Robinhood? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really easy way to, you know, trade stocks on the iPhone. And, um, you know, it's, it's quite popular with people who like apps like that. And it feels like it's made by Apple. I mean, it's, 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 it's like you could see there being a version of, stocks it's like stocks plus or something and, it, and it's that wow well, you actually trade that'd be a that'd be elite but i guess they did make a credit card so. yeah <laughs> it, I, I mean there's um I, I, go ahead I, i'm not convinced that they're going to do like an api okay it's i mean they might do but like they did one for music but then it's like where they're going to make money off of apple more me well, well they, they do they do some they they do their own stuff with their weather data. Like they put it in maps, you know, they put it in some places where they, I think they will, you know, because they, you know, not just because they put it in maps in some other places, but um, this is the privacy angle and all of that. It's like, you know, you can, you can put, you can include this, you know, data provider who you may or may not trust, or you can use ours because it's private and it's not about money. It's about privacy and it's about, you know, I mean, it's a big problem for Apple that, that they claim to be the, the private company, you know, in terms of like, you know, what happens in your iPhone says your iPhone until you open the app store. And then it's, <laughs> you know, and, and that's one category where they could say, we, we've, we fixed that privacy hole. We fixed know? it. And it is true, actually, if they made like, you know, weather a system API, they could even make it so that if the third party app is using the weather API for its information. As a user, the- you could opt to not use that and see theirs. The, the third party app wouldn't even have to ask for location permissions. Oh yeah, it'd be easier. Yeah, they could even do an Apple sign in style thing where they're like, if you are a weather app, you have to give the option to use our weather data. Yeah, I, there is definitely like, and maybe they could sell it. Like maybe it, maybe we would be too charitable and that they would just give the, the the API for free. Like they could sell it to these companies and say like, if you want to use it, you got you got to pay us. Yeah. The the Apple Maps web embed thing is quote unquote free but if you're a big company you have to pay for it so mm. they already do something like that like, remember there was a twitter basically... api like that that you could just use <laughs> yeah that'd be nice wouldn't that yeah. but yeah like the apple maps apple maps obviously lets you do like maps embeds inside of ios apps that's always free uh, they let you do some kind of like local search lookups inside ios as well but not really to the extent that you could like make an autonomous maps client for it right it's just limited enough to be useful in some situations what about cloudkit uh, CloudKit is CloudKit is like a is like a sync and storage data platform for that helps make Apple's iOS, all iOS apps better and that is quote unquote free with limits. So if you ever use it, then you do get charged. But most people would never get charged for it. But I think that one's that one you can definitely argue has like widespread appeal of just making all of the App Store better. Mm-hmm. Maybe they do it for weather. Maybe. I don't think it's like 100%. There's definitely benefits and things they could do, especially like the thing where you wouldn't have to require the third-party apps to have any location permissions at all. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. 100% they're going to revamp the weather app. Are they going to yeah. do... And I would also... Well, I, I thought about this too. It's like, you know, do they do weather app using dark sky data with notifications? Or do they do weather app with dark sky data... And Dark Sky remains this like separate thing that you know it, it's because the Dark Sky app cannot be a weather app on its own. I mean, some people use it that way, but it's mainly about like that what's happening in the next few minutes for participation. Um, you know, uh, hmm. sure, I, I guess it's a puzzle. It was definitely out of the blue. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. He's like, whoa. I think it's a good. I think it it makes sense for them, right? And I I think people got a bit like to. Uh, annoyed that you know they were shutting the api and stuff like apis are never guaranteed to always exist if dark sky was shopping around for an acquisition there was probably a good chance the api wasn't going to stay around forever anyway because either dark sky was going to go out of business or yeah. someone else was going to buy the api well, and at least the api is being supported through the end of 2021 so it gives a decent amount of time for all these companies that depend on it to find alternate options mm-hmm. and if if the demand for you know a, a nice weather api is so strong some other company will fill the gap. Uh, yeah, and I've I've seen. I mean, people are even mad about just having a privacy focused weather app for Android. You know, one if Google wanted to provide that, they could. The other thing is, um, I think apps exist. Like I saw someone recommend Appy Weather 
So I, I don't use Android or know about the apps, but that's one thing I think is, is you know, in, it's in the discussions at least as like an alternative. So. Nice. Yep, yep, yep. So we'll see what happens in Dark Sky um, based on your calendar, at least in 2021. And that, that totally gives us like, you know, the, the ending the API thing is like, yeah, I mean, A, it's generous for, you know, an API, you know, it's goodwill, but also it gives Apple time to, you know, a year and a half's time to to kind of have a solution in place for when that goes away. Um, yeah, to have a new weather app ready for iOS 15. At least a new weather app ready for iOS 15, yeah. Yeah. So, because, because you wouldn't want to buy Dark Sky, take away something, and, and have nothing to deliver. You know, even if it isn't an API yet, even if it's, you, there's just no benefit because there's no new weather app or anything like that, that would be uh, bad, so... It is kind of funny they're still selling the app and they didn't just like make it free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. Like four bucks, of, you know. I don't know. I mean, I guess they 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 sell apps. You know, <laughs> it's not new. But uh, my and I don't know if this is the actual reason, but like it kind of ties into what I said about the servers being overloaded. Like, if they suddenly made it free, would they just like collapse the servers because they're not prepared to support that? But or or um, I mean, I guess they're they're bought now, right? I mean, they announced the acquisition that it's. Or is it pending? You know, I don't, I don't know the specifics of that. Well, but. that's another question that is not hundred percent clear on because when they when they bought Shazam, that was like announced earlier twenty eighteen, uh-huh. and then it didn't actually get completed until like late in twenty eighteen. Yeah, I mean, it went it, it went through uh, investigations for, for privacy re- or for um, monopoly reasons, right? And so, but but did it move to Apple's account yet? <laughs> I don't recall. This this moved to Apple's account at least. I think it did move when they finally closed at the end of last year yeah so maybe this was just so small it's already closed too because they, they adopted their privacy policy and everything so i don't know yeah presumably it's a done deal yeah okay yep um we also have a, a story on um apple watch touch id and this comes from the verifier which is, is anything but verified yeah i mean we, we, it's kind of funny because we've been talking about the verifier for a long time of like okay we the first time we talked about it was like we don't know yet because there's no track record now i have a track record where things they talk about uh might be super early in development and eventually come but they're also so uh high level that they come sometime anyway <laughs> it doesn't feel like dependable information right? yeah like, yeah but what they said was this week was that apple is working on a touch id system for the apple watch and one option would be to put it in the crown so you'd like put your finger on the crown it'd be like a fingerprint sensor in the button and then the uh other way would be to like actually do like the cooler thing where the fingerprint sensor is like integrated into the screen and you just lay your finger on the screen it would unlock you know they're, they're sensible ideas and that apple's probably working on down the road who knows if it's coming next year as the verifier claims right what I found interesting is when I posted this story, there was a lot of backlash that was like, why is Apple bothering this? What's the point? Because you can already, you know, you can type in the four-digit pin code or when you unlock your iPhone, it unlocks your watch. What The the the, the roadmap that you can see very clearly being mapped out for the Apple Watch is independent. And it sure looks like we're getting to a point where the watch can be bought on its own and you won't need an iPhone at all, mm-hmm. right? Or they're at least they're at least setting it up so... That is an option that they can very quickly pivot to if they need to. Like, say, if the the smartphone market created, right? They could just immediately here's here's an Apple Watch that basically works by itself. And so, in that situation, typing in a pin code is always mandatory and always required, right? At least once a day when it's on your skin, mm-hmm. and being able to authenticate with fingerprint and biometrics is is way more convenient. Is it super important that is like is it so important? No, that's why they haven't done it already, right? <laughs> right? Clearly, it must be on the list of things that make the Apple Watch experience nicer. And even in the current world, where you can use your iPhone to unlock your watch, I find personally, I'm always typing in my PIN code at least once a day. And it's just annoying enough that they should fix it. So <laughs> Yeah. There, there are also new things. Like, there's now the App Store on the watch. And, you know... You can you can do you can make purchases and things you know there's the whole there's always been the whole double click the side button to authenticate um, in a future where you know we haven't rolled out iPhones getting under the screen Touch ID right like that's back in the rotation of rumors yeah um, for sure and so in a future where that's a thing that, that's a you know muscle memory that you have 
than than having that same thing for the watch would be very cool you know even if it's just for you know separately this dream of the apple watch being standalone you know um much sooner that for kids um you know well that won't be the watch that the kids get i i imagine but um you know, long term, it would be ideal. Is that the, the uh, you know, that you get this in the watch? And so I, I agree, like you, it's not something that they needed to do in the first five versions or six versions, but um, why not? And it's it, especially tied with the idea of the iPhone eventually getting this, you know, under the screen as an option or as, as the method, then, then consistency there would be really cool. Yeah, for sure. It just seems like I—I I was just surprised that so many people were like, "This is stupid." That's not, you know, it's a—it's a nice little feature that will probably happen one day. If you don't want an iPhone, no. If you don't want an Apple Watch Eight, don't buy it. <laughs> buy one, and you'll like it. Bring it back, Jonathan. Man, iPhone Four song. Uh, lastly, there's iOS thirteen point four point five. One? No, beta beta one point five. Yeah, it's from the future. Because we're on iOS 14.4, right? Not even... 13.4, yeah. Yeah, 13.4, not 0.4.1. And this is 0.4.5, skipping 1, 2, 3, and 4. And wasn't it the verifier who had a story that was like, iPhone 13, iOS 13 will only go up to 0.4, you know? Yeah. 13.4.4, and then like the next day this happens, and... You know, there's history of this happening before where you have a beta version that's like future numbered and the idea there is that there could be versions in between or <laughs> something else happened. Um, and this this is... And they shipped this. Uh, iOS 11.2.2 mm-hmm. came out. Yep. And then two weeks later, iOS 11.2.5 came out. That's right. <laughs> you know, kind of like the iPhone 8 and 10, but but in software, you know, it's, it's just a number and it, I, you know, I'm sure there's some significance to it happening, you know, with with the with the development train, uh, and how it all goes together. But no, yeah, yeah when it when it because this was Tuesday, right? This yeah. this this came out, and so it seemed like oh, they must be uh, you know pushing through an urgent bug fix of virus thirteen point four point one that will be coming out very very soon. Yeah. So they're starting the beta train with the number further highest. So they've got that leg room, but so f- to date iOS 13.4.1 hasn't come out, so it's kind of in a weird like limbo situation. We'll just have to see how it kind of plays out, really. Mm-hmm. If if the iPhone SE is coming out tomorrow, maybe it runs iOS 13.4.1, which is why it was hailed up. Yeah, yeah, why it was skipped, yeah. Or Monday, because if it's not tomorrow, it doesn't mean it's not next week. <laughs> yeah. And by tomorrow, I mean today, but whenever. <laughs> but, but we believe very strongly that by the next time we talk next thursday on the happy hour podcast we can talk about the iphone se 2020 yeah and i'll, I'll talk about the new ipad too because of course i have one right of course yeah so <laughs> uh, uh, uh i think a, a uh, nine to five mac reader and happy hour listener and, and certainly a uh, follower uh, from twitter uh, was was kind enough to take up my offer on twitter on my old ipad pro from 2018 and uh and and and, fi- and that was to finance the purchase of a new one so it worked out worked out um all right that is the happy hour podcast for this week we can be found online i'm on twitter and apollo zach at uh, i'm on twitter and instagram at apollo <laughs> zach. hello it's been a long day it's been a long recording session uh at, at apollo zach a-p-o-l-l-o-z-a-c and you can also read my work not just on 95 mac but on space explored.com that's space news and history and benjamin you're on twitter at bza mayo and you blog at bza mayo dot com that's right and with that being said we will be back next week bye everybody bye bye